Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Gay is not sin. And Jesus is not asking the gay person to change and be straight. We're living in exciting times. And wonderful things are going to happen. But also some shaking things are going to happen. As we all know that usually life-changing events that affect your personal life and you has to be something that's usually pretty shocking. Uh, nearly die. Uh, you're th thrown into a situation that you never thought you'd ever be in. And you go off to war and see death all around you. And you come back and you and you're a different person than you were previously. So we're seeing that it takes some dramatic event to get you to change your life. Now changing your life is not just moving from one city to the other and then you have a whole different surrounding because you bring yourself with you. So it's you that needs to change. And in Christianity, God has been presenting things to us to help us change. It, we've come through several different phases of that God has put on the earth so we can be ready to live eternity with him. Now, we have no problem with that if we believe in Jesus, that he's the son of God, that he paid the price for our sins, that our sins will be forgiven. So when we accept Jesus and accept his work on the cross and ask him to forgive us, we know that this seals us to have eternal life with Jesus. But this is not all of it because we've had e phases of what God has done on earth. We had that in the garden, which didn't work. And we had out of the garden for a thousand years, which didn't work. And we had Moses coming, I mean Noah coming out for about as long. And then we had Moses, which actually brought the law and that didn't work and then we had David and Solomon which shored up the nation of Israel made it more powerful and and strong and built the temple of God that didn't work and then Jesus came and he died and people say well that's a final sacrifice and and that should work well it does it's provided it legally it gets you saved if you actually believe that God sent his son to die for you that Jesus Christ is the son of God and he rose on the third day legally if you believe that then you're saved forever any time after that if you die and you still believe that then you will live eternally the people that are alive they still within choice now we're seeing 2,000 years of Christianity where people can accept Jesus and believe that he's the son of God and God rose on the third day but we could check out history it is well documented that the church has not been the best thing it, that it should be because it's supposed to represent God and and Jesus Christ and what salvation is. However, we know for a fact that this isn't particularly working either. Because people are quick to sin, quick to persecute others. And we had considerable terrible time for Christianity. And good times too. Christians has caused a lot of good in the world, no doubt about that. But it's, it's just that we need to understand that Christians don't seem to be able to all the ways that God provided to finally be good people. And we have in the United States people that are supposedly 
good, wonderful Christians, that it seemed like the ones that are most outspoken and the most loud about their faith in God often are the ones that history shows has been basically the worst. In the formation of the United States, we've had the South, which had slavery and all that types of customs around that, which we're still fighting today down there. They're, they're still trying to figure out sh should they keep or get rid of the a lot of the history record of that time. But then when we trace out these same kinds of Christians that we found in the South in those days and where they spread and influenced these days, we generally call them red states. And they have this pattern which summed up simply is they're not loving their neighbor as themselves. And this is very essential to God's plan is you to love your neighbor as yourself. And if you can condemn 750 million people to hell without hope in God, you're not loving your neighbor as yourself. And if you're going out trying to make all kinds of laws so you don't have to respect them or love them, then you're not obeying what God wants you to do. We have great evidence today that Christianity is still in that past 2,000 years area where they'd rather do it themselves. They don't want to obey God even though they believe they are. They're definitely not ready for something like the rapture or eternity with God. It doesn't mean they're not saved because again if you believe in Jesus and you die there's going to be something happen. There's a couple of ways that God's going to get you ready. You can't get you ready just like getting saved and forgiven you can't do anything. You can't earn it. You just believe. It's a free gift. It's by the grace of God that you're saved. Not of anything that you do. Well, to be ready for the rapture or eternity, to actually be able to get into your spirit body and live eternity with Jesus, you can't do much about it. You have all this 2,000 years of, of living in Christ and it's still you're failing as human beings and this is what human beings do they cannot they're quick to sin and they cannot earn eternity and so God has again provided a way to do this people in Christ that die believing they get to go through death's gate and we have the scriptures that tell us where's your victory where's your sting when it talks about death's gate because when you go through death's gate and don't come back you're going to go through a process <clears throat> who knows what that is <clears throat> whether you're able to look down during the tribulation period and seeing the believing Christians getting shaken and this gets you to come to grips with your eternal spirit Something happens when you die and you go through death's gate and you don't come back. That gets you ready for eternity. And that is one of the guarantees that if you believe in Jesus and you die for whatever reason, then you're going to make it because you're going to go through death's gate where that lesson is going to be given you. But if you're alive, you don't have that luxury of <clears throat> the guarantee of death's gate getting you ready for your spirit body and your wedding gown. So you have to get ready while you're still here on earth. And like I said earlier, it takes some pretty shocking things to get people to have life-changing experiences. When people just about die, they say they go to heaven and they come back. And usually you see quite a change in their lives. It doesn't mean that when they tell you what they saw that they're right because they're still in their body and they're interpreted according to their background and their belief and so forth. So you're not, even if God's telling you something directly, you're going to come back and interpret it a way that, that you believe. 
we have some 35, 37,000 de Christian denominations, so we could pick what we want to be comfortable in that kind of fits along the line that we believe. <clears throat> doesn't mean they're right. It doesn't mean that they're wrong in their, some of their doctrines, but it doesn't mean all their doctrines are right. Something has to happen, and often even shocking doesn't happen. People just are stubborn, and they want to stick in their ways. The Bible gives us some references to as many as two-thirds of Christians will turn their backs on Jesus. And so about a third, just like in uh, Elijah's day, when Elijah thought that <coughs> everybody's turned from God, when God told Elijah, you know, no, I kept 7,000 that remained faithful to me. We think 7,000 in the, the land of Israel where it started out with at least 2 million people when they came out of Egypt. So that's a lot of people. Only 7,000 stayed with God? Well, we got one-third of Christianity today that is likely to stay with God. And then the other two-thirds are going to have to be refined as fire and only a third will survive. So two-thirds of the two-thirds sounds like it's going to be perishing. Jesus doesn't want anybody to perish. God doesn't want Jesus to lose anybody that he's given Jesus. So God's going to spend time getting you ready for eternity with Jesus. And it's got to be by shock and awe. And that takes a tribulation period. The two witnesses are coming so they could get the church ready. They don't just wreak havoc on Antichrist's kingdom. They're shaking the church and making things happen in the church that you'll have these experiences of, of shock that are life-changing. People go off to war, and when they come back, they're different people. There's interesting when people just simply go to another country when they're still relatively young and spend some time, and they come back to the United States. It, it's easy to see how everybody that hasn't had such experience have no clue about anything. It's just like there's almost a different world, a different kind of human. If when you if you went to a foreign country and you lived there for a year or something and then you come back and you start looking around and seeing people who's never been any out of their even their own town or something uh, and you could see right away there's something and you can't explain it to them there's just something that you know that is definitely missing from them they didn't have an experience what has opened their my, mind to how big this world is that God made and how wonderfully made it is. And so we're going to have to have some kind of thing happen to us that's going to give us this something that's going to give us a life-changing experience. And it's not going to be fun. The two witnesses are going to give plagues anytime they wish, anytime they will it. And it's not going to be a fun thing. And, and if anybody come to hurt them, they're going to be killed. It's, it's not a simple thing as, oh, wait a minute, I won't kill you. No. They, something comes out of their mouth and they're killed. Anybody that tries to hurt the two witnesses will be killed. In Elijah's day, 50 people at a time was sent to him and fire came down and destroyed them. Didn't decide which one was maybe good or you know oh they are they have family a family man or something like that or they're actually decent folk no they all 50 died when when these things start happen there's not going to be very much respect to our persons and according to scriptures it appears that half of the world population will be killed in the first three and a half years of the tribulation and so and Christians aren't going to be raptured out as so many false doctrines teach today which comes if you wanted to look it up a woman named Margaret in the 1830s is, that was an occultist had a dream 
And she said, in that dream, God told her there's going to be a pre-trib rapture. And then about 10 years later, in 1840, Darby enhanced that, her vision, to kind of begin to fit into a church-wide doctrine. And so you have this false doctrine that so many churches are believing, which if you think about it for a second, how are we going to get all of these Christians with so difference of opinions on about things and they're supposed to be ready and Christians have been hurting people for a very long time and you don't give any mercy to people that that don't believe like you and you think that you're just going to the rapture is going to happen and nobody cares. All the people that died in Christ, persecuted by other Christians throughout the past 2,000 years, nothing, no answers to those prayers. God is just and he has promised us that he will answer our prayers when we call on him. And people have died without seeing these answered. And God has reserved a time to answer the prayers of all these saints that has died at the hand of other saints throughout history. And so there's going to come a time because there is the book, I think it's Maccabees or something like that, that tells you that could have been in the Bible, it's in the Catholic Bible, uh, that tells you that Christians are going to be sitting around praising God and loving and believing in the return of Jesus. And then sudden destruction is going to come on them. They're going to wonder why. And God's going to say, why are you worrying? Why? Because what I'm doing is punishing you for Christians' past sins for the past 2,000 years. But who are you worried about that if I'm punishing you for their sin? Your sins are actually worse than those previous saints' sins. We're coming into a time where there's going to be a correction going on. And God so loved the world that he's not, I mean, try, if he's going to do everything he can to not let any person that he gave Jesus uh, perish. But it's still free will, still your choice. You're going to turn your backs on Jesus. Even if you're sitting there watching me right now and you think you're so wonderful, you can think that all you want. You're, you're good likely, like I said, two-thirds of people are probably Christians. They're probably going to turn their back on Jesus. And if they do that, what's that mean? they got to be then leading their support towards Antichrist. Now, Antichrist is not going to say, hey, I'm Antichrist, and I hate Jesus and all that. He's going to appear to be maybe even Jesus. And his... Answers are going to satisfy you quite a bit. And when these two witnesses come on the scene, he's going to fight against them. He's going to tell you he can kill them. And you're, you're as Christians, are going to give him the final signature to be dictator of the world. And then he will be able to kill the two witnesses. It'll take him about 30 days because Antichrist as ruler of the world has 1290 days according to Daniel and but you can't start at the beginning because Antichrist according to Revelation is still active and will be actually grabbed up by an angel on the last day of the tribulation and thrown in chained up and thrown into a pit where he'll be for a thousand years so you have to calculate Antichrist's days from the very last day of the tribulation upwards towards the front of the tribulation. Now we all know that at the beginning of the tribulation the two witnesses begin their ministry and they have 1260 days. So when these two antichrists and the two witnesses pass cross, the, the two witnesses are at their 1230th day. They have 30 days left over before they're killed. So antichrist has 30 days to kill them. And the church will give him that power because they want the two witnesses killed too. Because they're bringing all manner of plagues and, and prophesying against pastors and terrible things are going to happen. And 
people are just saying, well, this is not supposed to happen. We're supposed to be protected and taken out of all of this. So, so they're begin. They're, they're either directly not like Jesus and reject him, or they'll just begin to believe that isn't Jesus, and this other guy uh, that seems to be helping out in the world, making things better, at least as far as they can see, and he's promised he can kill the two witnesses. He seems more like Jesus than anything, so he's a much better person to give their support to. And sure enough, he kills the two witnesses right there in the middle of the tribulation, and Christians alike with unbelievers are going to celebrate and give gifts and so forth until the shocking revelation to Christians the two witnesses rise from the dead and then go on up to heaven right in front of their eyes and then they probably have about another 75 days to ponder the past three and a half years and so as the Bible says there's going to be people about a third of them are going to be refined. Well, they're all going to be, be refined, but a third will be able to come through that refiner's fire and be ready for the wedding gown. The dead in Christ are already getting ready because they died, went through death's gate. So when the dead rise first, they could slip right into their wedding gown. No, he's going to heaven na naked. And we which re re remain in life, we see a lot of movies and things show our clothes are just laying there. Well, we're not going naked. We're going to come out of our clothes, slip right into our wedding gown. And right now, we can't fit in the wedding gown. The wedding gown won't go on people that are as filthy as Christians are. And so you need to be cleaned up and gotten ready. And that last 75 days is when Christians are going to finally figure out things and get this life-changing experience even though they had a life-changing experience when they accepted Jesus they need another life-changing experience realizing that they've been shaken because of church-wide sin and so you'll be then able to slip into your wedding gown and you, the first step again is to get saved and to do this is believing in John 3.16 where it says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes him shall have everlasting life. So this makes it really simple. See, God's made it really simple for us. He just gave us two things to obey and we can't seem to be able to do that and that's to love God with all our being and that actually takes care of the first four of the Ten Commandments and then to love our neighbor as ourselves. So uh, law-wise and what we have to do ourselves is simply love our, love our neighbor as ourselves. So two simple commands that were given. So it shouldn't be too hard when people try to tell you you got to obey this or you got to do that or you're doing this or you're going to go to hell because you're living in sin. This is not what the Bible says. The Bible says that the law is covered under the blood of Jesus Christ when you obey love your neighbor as yourself and when you love God with all your being you're obeying the whole law otherwise if you tell one person that he's sinning and living in sin then you have to obey every law that Moses gave you from God and you got to sacrifice animals so you can get forgiven day by day year by year as such as was done in Moses' day and Old Testament days. So believe in Jesus. Pray with me. Says to say, Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God and that God rose you on the third day, that you died and your shed blood was worthy to pay the price of my sins. Forgive me of my sins and come into my life. And then the proof, Jesus rose on the third day, showing he was worthy to forgive your sins. So if you pray to prayer like that, you're forgiven. And if you die or anything like that, and you still believe that, then you're going to go through death's gate where you're going to get the lessons of the chastisement of the past sins of the church for the past 2,000 years. But Jesus gave us something else to get, makes it even easier. 
should make it easier also can make it more complicated and that is the baptism of the Holy Spirit if you ask Jesus to baptize in the Holy Spirit and determine to seek the baptism of the Holy Spirit then you will be given an intercessory language that the Holy Spirit can pray through you and make intercessory prayer for others and give you power to endure to the end and other gifts of the Spirit which one of the gifts of the Spirit is healing and you could be healed right now that didn't pass away just put your hand right there now on that place that you have pain or sickness you got your hand there in the name of Jesus be healed now tune in each week same time you're watching now I come on the same time every week a few times a week and also help me out go to my website press the GoFundMe button or the donate button give a little give a lot appreciate that now God bless you tune in next time